Hello, my name is Rick Miles. I am superintendent of schools here in Scotts Bluff. Um, and as I speak with you now, near the end of June, um, my goal is to help update you as families and community members, as well as staff, where we are as we look ahead to the next school year and our plans evolve looking toward August when our kids will be back in school and we'll be able to get started in a way that I think we'll all feel good about. Um, we have lots going on. We've been busy working at it uh, for months now, um, but we know thankfully we still have a month or two to go. And in that time, the work will continue. Um, so today will be a quick overview on where we're at, what we know, what we don't know. Um, and hopefully it will at least help everyone have the same conversation together as we move forward. So what do we know now? We know, now, we know now that school will begin as planned with students reporting to their buildings on Monday, August 17th. Um, that's certainly barring any emergencies, um, but barring any totally unexpected events, um, that's our, our intent and um, we're anxious to make sure we do all the things that are necessary to make sure that that happens. Let's take just a minute to look at where we've been. Um, we don't want to recount history in too much detail, but I think it'll help for us to go through things just a bit and, and, and take a look back. As you'll all recall, this, this all began Sunday night, March 15th, when Panhandle Public Health District um, advised all Panhandle area schools districts to go ahead and move to a remote instructional mode. Uh, and very soon after that, the entire state complied with that as well. Everything changed. Uh, we even conducted remote parent-teacher conferences. All new communications had to occur. Um, but most of all, it was the feeling we had to keep track of thousands of kids, and none of them were physically in school. Our teachers and our school administrators and our support staff have done an incredible job. And I think you're all aware of what instruction had to look like and how tremendous that effort was to pull this off um, and, and make it happen with such little notice, literally overnight. While that was going on, a lot was happening as well. I'd like to make special mention of Travis Rickey, our facilities director and his team, David Davis, our te technology director and his team, uh, Melinda Wollaston and the food service team, along, along with uh, Marcy Lecker, our chef, um, our business team led by Mary Ann Carlson, um, our student services support, Wendy Kemling, our curriculum and instruction um, with Mike Mason and the content area specialists. Um, our job was to do everything we could collectively to support teachers and staff in working with kids. Remarkably, it was business as usual, so to speak, in many ways, and the same operations were necessary once the buildings closed as they were before. We still were getting option applications, transfer applications, registrations were coming in all sorts of forms, as you all could imagine applications, accounts payable and receivable, student data management, next year scheduling, attendance, transcripts, all those things were going on um, here in this office, um, though remotely um, throughout the entire time. Fact number two, none of us chose to have this happen, but thanks to this community, um, we've been able to provide students uh, quality supports, um, though obviously nothing resembling what life is like when kids are really here. Um, but we've gotten through this, uh, and that's thanks to the support, first of all, of parents and families, um, and it's been tough. It's been painful. Um, and with nearly 3,500 students and well over 400 employees, it was important, and I hope we all believe that it made a difference. 
content, because we understand that in this region, our school district has a tremendous responsibility that we need to take seriously. Um, we impact directly and indirectly so much of what happens in this region. And we certainly hope that part of the reason we've been able to forestall spread of this disease, at least to some degree, if not a significant degree, is because together we all made the sacrifices in terms of schooling um, that we did um, to get us through this. So the rehab opening has now begun and summer programming is reflecting that. On June 22nd, the governor relaxed his directive health measures. Uh, they no longer apply to schools. And now there are really two entities that are overseeing decisions that are made in school districts in Nebraska. That's the Department of Education and the local Panhandle Health District. In fact, this summer we had at least 350 students complete remote summer school. We'll begin face-to-face -face summer school in July for groups of 10 students at each grade level, kindergarten through third grade, for specialized reading support. And as we all begin to reoccupy our offices in safe, phased-in ways to get through this summer safely, we will begin to conduct our operations in a much more familiar way that will make all of us more comfortable as staff members and our community more comfortable as well. So moving forward, as these events occur and you see more and more opportunities um, for our kids to enjoy facilities and opportunities within the school itself. We want to ask that we continue to maintain common sense approaches to safety and health. Those include things like reasonable distancing, um, wearing masks when you're in proximity of others at these events, um, and it makes sense. Um, hand washing frequently, all the things that have become so routine for us now. We want to make sure that we don't set ourselves back or unnecessarily cause any students or any staff members to miss time at school because we know that has a tremendous impact. And that can be through becoming infected, that can be by having to be quarantined because of a close contact who is infected. The more we can minimize that, the more we're going to be able to keep school going at full bore keep parents working, keep businesses opening, and do all the things that as a school system we need to do to just help keep the gears continue to move in our community and in this region. Third fact, as you see, we are conducting a safe, prudent reopening, and it's already well underway. Now looking ahead, as I record this message, we're about six or seven weeks out from the first day of school. What we've been doing for several months now is having frequent and regular team meetings. These are the areas that we have focus groups meeting regularly to put together detailed plans in each of these areas as we look at school opening. As summer progresses, the school-based teams will have increased significance as principals ramp up those meetings to start to make very specific decisions about how school will open. Something that you might keep in mind is the Launch Nebraska website. It's launchne.com. And that's the website that anybody can go to, and you'll see it continually evolve. There are many state committees. Um, a couple of us in the district are participating on one or two of those committees as well. And I know in the committee meetings that I've attended, um, we've really focused on looking ahead to developing some clear criteria 
that school districts will be able to rely upon to make decisions. So no individual, superintendent, principal, community member, board member, none of us has the weight of making those decisions individually. I expect that we'll see a risk uh, dial um, that looks similar to this. This is only an example. Um, it's one that's actually um, being put in place in Lincoln, uh, for the city of Lincoln. All of the local panhandle health divisions are working on this um, together. And there'll be a common dial that will be developed. And then there will be backup tables that will say when you're in a yellow zone, these are the things to think about. When you're in an orange zone, think about these things and so on. So based upon the local conditions, and that's what I'm really encouraged about, it will be local conditions. We'll be able to make decisions that are in the best interests of everyone. As you know, the federal government has been very much involved in supporting local communities um, by providing some relief financially. Schools have been part of that with the elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund. In fact, Scotts Bluff, due to our demographics and our size, um, is receiving um, almost as much um, as all but a very small handful of schools in the state. Um, that money is intended to ensure not only that we're ready, should we ever have to get back to a remote environment again, um, but also to make sure that we do everything we can to help kids return to school successfully and support that in any way we can in terms of their academic well-being, their social and emotional well-being, and their own physical health. These are the sorts of things that those CARES dollars can be spent on. We've already done some things in the schools that will help maintain a safe environment. Um, we have already uh, continued to enhance our technology to make sure that remote accessibility um, will be possible for virtually every single family member. In fact, we were able to get a jump on all this. So by the time we completed remote instruction, this spring, over 98% of our families had both connectivity in terms of internet and had a device of their own or from the school that was able to support them. It's also very important in everything we do that we involve lots of voices. So we're conducting two surveys and they will be released on or about July 2nd. Um, and they'll be able to be accessed for about 10 to 12 days after that. Um, they'll be released to all families and we will also be having staff complete their survey too. So we get a sense of where our staff, our teachers especially are in terms of return to school. Um, we'll also be conducting focus groups. I'll be meeting with a couple of different groups of teachers next week um, and um, as we move more to school-based decision-making um, that's very specific to school environments, our principals will get increasingly involved with their school communities as well. Fact number four. I'd like to take a few minutes to look at frequently asked questions that we've heard in the community um, and begin to consider um, where we're headed um, in a way that's more increasingly based upon what we know is important to our own community, both our internal staff and our families and our students. There you see some examples of some questions that have come in. Yes, we'll be opening school. All plans are pointed in the same direction as planned for August 17th. 
Um, we do anticipate, as I've said, um, that there will be uh, different levels that will guide our decision making. We anticipate that that will change. We don't know how things are going to be tomorrow, let alone let next week, next month, and when school begins. And we anticipate that that will continue to waver, both as conditions in the community and within our schools change. We also know there may be unique conditions if somebody or a group of kids gets infected in one particular school. We need to make decisions about how that will impact others. What happens if a staff member is infected? All those kinds of decisions um, need to be made in a short-term way, but need to be based on criteria that have been established ahead of time. Some of you may not feel comfortable sending your student to school, and we need to make sure we have adequate plans in place for that. In fact, we will have one elementary school teacher trained with Zoom capabilities uh, at each grade level in our elementary and middle school so that we will be able to deliver remote zoomed in instruction from classrooms with a live teacher uh, at each of those grade levels and in each subject. The high school things will have to be more individualized. Lots of things are occurring to make the school environment safer. You'll see when you come into our schools that we have ski sneeze guards in place and most of those high traffic kinds of counters and, and reception areas. We'll have bottle fillers uh, on all of our water fountains instead of traditional water fountains. Um, we will have electrostatic commercial sprayers in place so that every night we will be able to sanitize every single classroom and even more quickly than that if there's a specific issue that arises. We'll have isolation rooms for symptomatic students at our school while we're waiting for medical support and parents to get involved. We also have assigned a special return to school para in a temporary position at each school. Those positions will be absorbed through attrition as this event ends. However, there'll be somebody to just specifically help out in the school with problems related and needs related to the coronavirus. We'll also have additional health clinic staff um, and we'll have additional thermometers. Uh, we'll have additional PPE and all procedures and schedules are now being reviewed to try to examine things like the number of kids in the hallway at the same time, the number of kids that are eating at the same time. Um, and obviously we're looking at things that are prudent will have the least impact on the learning environment and on comfort of students during the day, um, and then be able to ramp up as needed if conditions dictate that. We need to remain flexible, we need to be prepared, we need to be physically responsible, we need to be thoughtful. One of the big questions is what happens if somebody shows up with symptoms at school? or test positive after they're attending school? What happens if that's a teacher? What happens if that's a student? All good questions, things we're going to need to be reviewing and getting advice from Panhandle Public Health and NDE about. Keeping our staff healthy is obviously important not only for their well-being, but for their students. What's reasonable? What do we do to make sure that that's as well tended to as possible? What will visitation look like? How do people get into our schools? Is there any kind of screening that occurs? All that is yet to be decided and those are the things that our teams are discussing and that we're looking forward to getting more direction on from the state level. We're reevaluating lunch service and how things are done. Um, for example, we don't anticipate having um, self-service food bars. Um, and other types of distribution methods that we feel might potentially uh, compromise health of others. And we're also looking at bus service. Um, we're already, in fact, examining how we're bringing some of our um, athletes from the high school to a couple of different events this summer. Um, but right now we're able to provide extra buses, we're able to social distance on buses, we're not using small vans and cramping them. Um, and using masks judiciously as it makes sense for those kinds of conditions. So all in all, 
um, this summer is providing us already opportunities to see how things will work and how we'll respond once school really gets started full bore in August. Our full intent is that fall sports, music, theater, and other activities will all continue and return in a safe manner. And we're working through details on that. Our internships are a real hallmark of our career academies, as is our dual credit uh, classwork, as is the shuttle service that runs to WNCC. Our plan is to continue all of those. We'll certainly work with local employers and honor their wishes on and what makes sense, as well as, of course, parents. Um, and same with college attendance. We're working with WNCC already um, to help make sure we plan that um, so that we're maximizing opportunities for kids and we're doing it in a safe manner that the community and our parents and kids themselves feel comfortable. We'll continue to update you through the summer. Um, we know that a lot of what we're seeing now is still to be determined. We'll have to figure these things out together and that things will keep changing as the summer progresses and we get closer to school. And so in closing, um, what I feel is most important is that we continue to remember what defines us as a school district. We are very proud of our reputation as one of the finest school districts in the state of Nebraska and beyond. Our vision remains to prepare our students for a challenging future. And in some ways, absolutely what's happening now is giving them a taste of the unexpected, how to be flexible, how to deal with ambiguity, how to work together. We will remain dedicated to our mission of every child, every student, every single day matters. And we'll continue to value the importance of treating each other with respect, communicating with clarity and honesty and openness and including and honoring all voices. I look forward to this conversation continuing. I appreciate the time you've spent viewing this today and together we'll make this a situation that we can look back on with pride. Thanks very much.